Hey everyone, Dennis Chang here. Welcome to another video. And I think this one's gonna be short. It will be short. <laughs> we'll see. This is a video about uh, an idea that I took from Django Reinhardt that I think is very cool and I want to share it with you. But as always, before we get started, if you're new to this channel, be sure to like and subscribe. These videos take a lot of time to make and um, I think it's good content and I'm giving it away for free. So I really appreciate if you can just help out in that way. And if again, you want to help out in a bigger way, you can check out my courses on Sound Slice. I have bebop courses, gypsy jazz courses for beginners. And also you can check out some of the stuff on DC Music School. So on the topic of uh, DC Music School, I get this a lot and I've addressed this issue before. But simple, some people seem to wonder what's the point of even trying to learn from people like Birel Legren, uh, Angelo Debar, Pat Martino, all these quote unquote virtuosos. What's the point? Because it's beyond the reach of mere mortals. And that's where you're wrong, where these people are wrong anyway. No matter what level you're at, you can always take something from them. In this case, what we're going to do, we're going to be taking concepts. So one way you can learn from an artist is, of course, to copy what they do verbatim, note for note, you know, the same rhythm, same articulation. Um, that's the obvious way. Some people do that. I've done that. But another way to do this is to take their ideas. And when you're taking their ideas, it doesn't have to be virtuosic. So let's say Birelli does some crazy like idea, arpeggio or something. Take the concept, which is the arpeggio. Let's say he's playing a G7 chord over a G7 chord. He's playing some kind of a D minor 7 flat 5 arpeggio. Well, take that D minor 7 flat 5 arpeggio and make it your own. Play it within your means. And this is exactly what we're going to do today. So there's this Django Reinhardt solo on a tune called All of Me, where it's a one chorus solo, and I think it was recorded in 1940 or 1941, where um, at the end of the A section, where it goes uh, G7, back to the second half to C, Django is thinking this voice line thing, D minor, D sharp diminish, or C diminish, the same thing, and then C over E. And this is a really, really cool concept because Django was more about voice leading than necessarily uh, playing, outlining exactly what the rhythm section was doing. Of course, that does happen, but sometimes he will superimpose his own chord progressions. So the idea here, well, D minor over G7, as I've mentioned in other videos, is a very typical thing to play over G7. And in fact, that chord progression could be D minor 7 to G7 to C. But anyway, so he starts off with a D minor idea, then to a C diminished or E D sharp diminished, and then resolves to C. It's this. So let's just hear that phrase. So that was the phrase. Now let me explain the reasoning behind this. So the D minor over a G7 chord, well here he's playing D minor 7, so it kind of has this G sus kind of quality. Because D minor 7 over G7 is a D, G sus kind of sound. And then basically this note stays the same, and these two notes go up, and that's where it comes from. It's a voice leading thing. So that D sharp diminished or C diminished, whatever you want to call it, is not related to the G7. It has nothing to do with G7 at all. But it's the idea of function. It is resolving from, is going from D minor to C. If you've watched any of my previous videos, which you should, I talk a lot about this concept that I call harmonic direction, which is function. Where is the music going? In which direction is it going? And when you work on that, it is less about which chords you're playing exactly, but more about how things are resolving from one chord to another. And that's how you can get away with all these crazy substitutions. Let me rephrase that another way. Hopefully you can understand it better. When you have a given chord progression, you can obviously choose to outline the chord progression in your improvisation, and it's something that is very common. But another very common thing is to superimpose 
other chord progressions over the existing chord progression and this new chord progression might not have might not have anything to do with the original chord progression and it's all about direction so it starts out with one chord that is the same as the original and then where there are different passing chords in between and we land where we're supposed to land and what's in between might not match the original chord progression this is something that jazz musicians have been doing since the beginning of jazz improvisation. Louis Armstrong does this. Uh, you can hear this in Coleman Hawkins playing, uh, Lester Young, Charlie Christian, all the greats, and definitely in the bebop era and onwards. So let me just explain this Django idea. So he starts off with a D minor 7 arpeggio. I chose to play it with this finger. I don't know how he did it, but I did this. And then voice lead. Uh, that's what he does that's diminished and this note is still part of diminished in fact it's this kind of arpeggio here or this this is a shape that Django liked to use and then here it's kind of this see uh, Django was musically illiterate but you could say oh this is from the diminished scale or whatever Django wasn't consciously aware of such things of these labels but he listened to a lot of music and he just heard that then going to resolve to c he heard that this sounded good so here it is the idea again slowly d minor then the d sharp diminish with this kind of scalar run resolving to c So one thing that I started doing later on is to make up my own ideas based on the concept. And that's very cool because that's how you come up with your own style if it's something that interests you. And how do I come up with these ideas? Again, you have to watch a lot of my previous videos where I talk about the importance of listening, immersing yourself in a language because for me, um, jazz improvisation is a language. And you have to listen to the music in such a way that you get something from it. It's like if you're learning, uh, let's say, the French language, which I do speak. But let's say um, you watch French television shows to immerse yourself in the language. Which is some, what some people do. But they get nowhere with it. Because it's in one ear, out the other ear. What you need to do when you listen to, uh, a t when you watch a TV show or movie in French, is take your time with certain keywords or grammatical points or sentence structures and uh, that's what I do when I'm learning Japanese which is something that I'm studying right now I watch Japanese shows and a 20 minute television show usually takes me 30 40 maybe 50 minutes to watch because I'm constantly rewinding I'm looking up words in the dictionary uh, trying to understand the grammar the vocabulary and all that and this is the same thing with music. You have to listen very attentively. In the beginning, with an instrument in your hand, and then you figure out what you hear and try to make sense of everything. Over time, though, you won't necessarily need an instrument with you anymore. Usually for swing music, uh, bebop, or gypsy jazz, whatever you, I can just tell what's going on for the most part just by ear. And then when I grab my instrument, I can often reproduce it and i'm saying this because you might be tempted to make it too academic and just think purely in terms of scales or arpeggios which is of course which are of course something that i do use but it's how i use them every style has these um, melodic um, signatures if you will for example bluegrass <laughs> That's one of the melodic signatures of bluegrass, right? But we're not going to say, okay, it's basically the uh, G Ionian mode where we take the root and then we take the, the second degree, then we raise it a crumb, make it the sharp nine, then to the third. No, it's just, it's just a G major scale. Or for example, blues guitar, you know, things like that. That, you know, you could say, oh, it's a pentatonic scale. Yes, it is, but it's just these signature melodic uh, inflections 
and you have to spend a lot of hours listening for these melodic inflection, inflections within each style or within each player. Each player has their own signature moves. All this to say that these phrases that I created, I have these uh, melodic tendencies in the back of my mind as I create them. And nowadays, because I've been listening to this kind of music for so long, it's usually fairly easy for me to make, make them up on the spot. In fact, these were actually improvised for you. So let's listen to the first one. Okay, in this first one, it's the same idea. I'm just thinking of D minor. In this case, D minor 7. Then this D sharp diminished. Then C. Oof, a little bit out of tune. It's the intonation. Resolve to C. And pay attention also to the voice leading. It's not like coming out of nowhere. When I approach this uh, D sharp diminished arpeggio, um, it comes from the D minor and then it resolves to the C major in a very logical way. Okay, let's listen to the next one. Okay, in, in this case, we have something that's based on this shape. I can do it here. I just did it here because I like the, the the kind of like the slides you get, but you can do it like that too. And here, one of those typical melodic inflections in the style of Django over C major. Okay, next one. So here we're doing it in this shape, in this area here, and thinking D minor 7. And notice that D minor 7 looks like F major. So actually over a D minor chord you can play F major. And diminish. Chromatic resolution. Again, typical um, Django style or even early jazz era idea. So that's it in the style of Django. But of course, you can apply this to quote unquote modern jazz or bebop as well. So let's check out one idea. So one way modern jazz players use this uh, D sharp diminished is to think a B7 arpeggio. I showed this uh, chord earlier, right? On the Django like, but you can turn that into a scale. So we have D minor. Then we have this B7 and to like E minor, but E minor is a substitute for C. Okay? And if you try to work on this phrase, you may notice that I delayed the resolution. That uh, over when I resolve to this, when the rhythm section resolves to the C chord, I'm continuing with my. Because this is something that is also possible to do. So if you're interested in this kind of phrasing stuff, I have a course on my Sound Slice uh, page dedicated to phrasing in swing music and uh, talks about kind of the historical evolution of certain rhythms that are very common in swing and bebop music. There you have it, short video, you see? <laughs> I can do short videos. Um, here's an idea. Why don't you guys make up your own phrases using this concept and then post them. Maybe I can learn something from you. However, like I said, to be able to make these phrases, you have to have a little bit of experience. Um, you have to put in, log in the hours, so to speak, trying to absorb this language. 
being familiar with various shapes across the fretboard. So if you're not at that level yet, it's totally fine. Just learn these licks and as copy and paste licks and keep playing them and eventually you'll develop muscle memory here and also your ears will get very accustomed to the sound and eventually you'll be able to manipulate them because that's how it was for me in the beginning in the beginning i could only play simple things and it's just like learning a language you can't expect someone who's learning french or japanese within the first uh, you know six months to be able to speak at the native level with all the slangs and expressions in the beginning it's going to be very simplified versions of the french or japanese language but as you get better you become more sophisticated it's also the way a baby learns to speak its mother tongue in the beginning there's it's again it's a very childish way of speaking and over the years they develop i guess what we call sophistication there we go thank you